welcome to DeKalb Talks Tourism. We have another exciting show with you today for you today with Chef Schuler. Welcome, Chef. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Chef Daryl Schuler, and I grew up in Central Florida, and I came to Atlanta in 1992 uh, to pursue a career in hospitality. And that career led me all over the world. Had an opportunity to be on the U.S. Culinary Olympic team in 2008. Uh, was able to go to Germany and get gold medals, which is a highlight for my career at oh, that wow. time. And then that propelled me to be one of 72 certified master chefs in the United States. Um, and I'm also owner and visionary of the Schuler Hospitality brand. Uh, under that brand, we have a couple of restaurant concepts, Farm, Kitchen, and Bar, which is located here in Tucker, Georgia. We also are managing partners of The Connector, which is located in the Microsoft headquarters building in Midtown. And we also have a catering company. We also do special enthusiast programs called Plated. It. Um, but what's really important about everything that I've done so far in my career is the Schuler Institute, a program that gives young men and women an opportunity to look at their life through hospitality and opportunity to pursue their culinary goals. So let's talk a little bit more about that. How, th this is your passion. Mm -hmm. So how did you get to this stage and, and know you want to do this? Because you've been so successful. I believe you're the first African-American master chef in the country. Right. So now I think you said before the show started, there's two of you all. There's two. So with all of this and with all your businesses that you're doing, tell us a little bit about the passion for this educational program. Well, the, the passion came from... Growing up in Central Florida, um, you know, uh, all the kids in the neighborhood, we all played together uh, because most of the time our parents worked seasonal jobs. And my mother in particular worked seasonal job. Uh, she worked in the citrus industry. And I just remember her coming home every day and she would have her tools and her apron and her shoes and she'd have all the citrus pulp. And what she would do is they would sit on, stand on these assembly lines and just peel and sectionize fruit all day long. Wow. And I just remember as a kid, just, you know, we didn't eat much during the week. We would have either a, a plate of corn and, and, and some okra or she'll make biscuits and some honey. And, and it wasn't really a complete meal. It wasn't until the weekend that she would go all out and, like, cook a huge meal. And she would do that for one reason. One, she would always think about the people in the neighborhood, hmm. the people that was across the street, the lady that was down the road. And after she get through getting up early in the morning, cooking this meal, we smell it all throughout the house. And she would put foil plates together. She'll wrap foil around plates. And she would stack them and she'll say, Daryl, take this to Miss Hattie House, Miss such and such house. And I would just go down the street and deliver these meals. And as I was delivering these meals, these people was waiting on their front porch for these meals. Wow. And I know a lot of people think like being a chef is like, hey, it's all about me. But that's where the passion came from, that hospitality of putting your effort forward, regardless of what you had or didn't have, and thinking about others. So fast forward to the day. Um, luckily, I've been able to have a very successful career, uh, travel all over the world, never spent the dime of my money to leave the country. Um, but is that all about me? Or is it all about who do I give that to now? Who do mm -hmm. I share that with? And there's a lot of young men and women out there just looking for an example someone like them from an environment from which they came from who have made it out of that situation and say, hey, if he can do it, I can do it. But how do you do it? So we created the Sugar Institute. And it's a place where young men and women can come and learn the art of cooking and hospitality in an environment that is open to the public. And that's why I'm so passionate about what I do. And it's just what I do as a chef. You know, I've worked in the industries for many, many years, had very high profile positions, uh, and then been able to manage a lot of people, a lot of projects. So being able to manage a couple of different companies all at once is just part of my repertoire. Is who I am. Is what I've done for many, many years. So how do you go about finding your students? So, you know, having the reputation that I have in the industry, a lot of people from around the country reach out to me. Um, through email, you get messages, phone calls. Um, we have a great connection with the local high schools, uh, especially here, specifically here in DeKalb County. And so we have that pipeline uh, to where young men and women can not only see me come into their facility and do demos, work with their educators, provide activities that will allow them to learn the art of cooking, hospitality in a real world setting uh, through our restaurant takeover. Um, and those students will look at that as an opportunity for them to say, hey, 
maybe the Schuler Institute is an option for me to go and consider um, either a career path or post-secondary education. Uh, we really do believe that having that strong pipeline from the high school level into post-secondary is the right way and the proper way of doing it uh, in this day and age where the industry requires a more educated, developed um, you know, uh, personnel in their kitchens and operations. So once they have gone through your program, is there a certification or a certificate or what's the outcome as far as the educational aspect? We know that on-the-job training mm-hmm. is huge, but what do they get as a take-home from from completing the training? So after completing our program, uh, all of our programs are less than six months. So we allow the students to get in, learn uh, through the different tracks that we have. So we have an intro program that, that teaches the students all the basic fundamentals of hospitality uh, and cooking and baking and pastry and so forth. And then we have an advanced program which focuses more on the management side. Uh, our advanced program centers around more of the international cuisines mm-hmm. so they get exposure of what the globe, uh, the global cuisine uh, platform look like. And then, of course, the advanced two program is where we really push the entrepreneur side of what they want to do, have an idea, how do you create that business plan, how do you go about launching that business. Um, When students graduate from our program, they'll graduate with a certificate from the Schuler Hospitality, uh, Schuler Institute, Um, and then also they'll have also accreditation through like the American Culinary Federation, and of course we're working with the Department of Labor in order for them to have that validation on their certificate. We are working with some other post-secondary operations and schools to have that um, articulation agreement so that those students who complete our program can matriculate into those other programs and complete either a bachelor's degree or a master's degree as well. So we're attacking it from both ends. So we talked about Georgia State University. Do you deal with the hospitality program with your program? Yes, that's the idea behind the Shula Hospitality uh, Group and the Shula Institute Um, We created this program so that we can partner with other programs within the state of Georgia. We are a state licensed institution. So we we have our license. We can work with other programs. And that's really the heart of what we do is connecting not only with other post-secondary education institutions, but corporations that will not only take our students but continue their education through a work environment. And that's what's really unique because I just think about when I was teaching at another uh, competitive uh, culinary institute here in Atlanta, um, students had to go out and find jobs. Students had to go out there and meet with a counselor in order to find a place to go and interview to do the internship. We're, 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 We're paving that way for them, clean and clear, so they have an opportunity to see their pathway into their future being provided to them. So our partnerships with our corporate partners is very, very valuable to our overall success. So you say it's a six-month program. Is that all three components? Each component is six months. Each month. So it would take a year and a half to finish everything. Right. Do you find most of them are doing all three or they're picking just the first one or first two? Because everybody's not going to be an entrepreneur. Right. So the other two seems like it would be kind of a must to be a chef and have your own restaurant. Mm -hmm. When you can get to that level, right? So where do you, where do they? Which ones are they doing the most of? It's a good blend between uh, complete all three tracks. You have a lot of students that want to see it all the way to the end because we focus on the uh, strong technical abilities first and foremost. I think technique is essential when you're looking at hospitality, specifically when you're thinking about food production. Uh, and then the science behind it, we focus strictly on the science of cooking. Uh, connected in with farmers, uh, bringing in top people in their particular fields to come in and explain why we do certain things or why certain things um, happen depending on which culture you're you're, you're cooking, right? So you think about international cuisine, you can't master that until you learn the the stories behind the food, right? You know, so I can't tell you how to cook on a walk and if you don't really understand the culture behind why they cook on walks. Well, Chef, I remember this Mm because it was – in COVID, but after where we were shut, not shut down anymore, mm-hmm. and you had the most phenomenal opening. It and to open this at the kind of mm-hmm. inside the window of COVID, right? But I remember going, and you had a wine per part of the meal, right? So your wine with your entree, I mean, right. with your appetizer, and and you were telling us the stories mm-hmm. behind. The country and mm-hmm. the wine and the pairing, and that was just such amazing experience. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you think about, you got a young man, you know, young woman who is considering hospitality as, as a gateway to their future. 
and you say to them that I want to train you just to work a line. That's not really attractive, right? Right. But if I can train you to work the line and take that experience and go on and do other things, now you're saying, wow, okay, I can consider hospitality as a choice. But then when you paint the picture that we're going to make you a global citizen, now you really got them entranced. You got their attention now. Because a lot of kids, the only thing they know is just their block yeah, or their city or their community. Or in, in this day and age, we got everybody in silos. You know, I believe that, you know, hospitality has allowed me to really diversify my abilities to communicate with people, engage with people, hear their stories. And once you understand people's stories and where they come from, you see there's a lot of similarities there. The walls of division starts to fall. Yes. And what better way of developing brotherhood is over a plate of food, right? Eating. You're right. So when you explain to them that, you know, a cultural dish that you're preparing is prepared by someone from that culture and they're telling you how they grew up and what obstacles they went through and why they prepare food a certain way, then you really can relate to it and then you become a, a, a young student who's going to become a master of their craft at some point. Well, Chef, you don't know mm-hmm. this, but yesterday our podcast was on the Greek festival. Mm-hmm. And we had Father Paul here and he was telling the stories of growing up and the Greek flavors and the Greek food, mm-hmm. so the international. So it was very interesting having yesterday was all about Greece today is international in general and, and culinary it's mm-hmm. very cool mm-hmm. to hear this this part of it yeah you know it's the people behind the food that really makes being in the hospitality industry so meaningful to people um, because you think about we work long hours um, it's a tough industry but there's so much passion that's driving that force behind it and whenever you do something with passion and love you know the long hours don't really bother you much you know, it's something that you, it's part of your destiny. You go do it for free. And knowing that what you do and the love that you put into that food or that plate or that service is impacting someone, you know, they came to your restaurant for a reason. Right. They could have had a bad day on their job. They could have been yeah. fired. And they come in there to you for you to give them service and a great meal and a great wine experience and storage behind the food you prepare. They're walking away saying, what? Life is a little bit better. Yep. I won't give up now. And that's what we got to look at. And that's why this hospitality group and the Shoot Institute that we created is so important in this day and age because a lot of kids are just looking at the streets as their their, their escape from life. And we know how that is. We see them on the, yeah. on the daily news every single day. Well, Chef, tell us, okay, so the, the Schuler Institute has teaching the kids. Mm-hmm. Now let's switch into the front of the house okay. and talk about the restaurant. So the restaurant, uh, Farm Kitchen and Bar, is located here in Tucker. Uh, when you walk through our doors and you look at this beautiful wood, oak, warm yeah. environment, you're like, wow, this is in Tucker. Yes, this is in Tucker. Um, we have a beautiful bar, um, plenty of seating in our restaurant. We don't try to pack you in there like we're trying to get a 1,000 people in a small space. That's not what we're about. We're about a quality experience. And when you walk in and you see that beautiful stainless steel sparkling kitchen over Mm -hmm. there to your left, you probably hear my voice rambling through the building because we're in there just in the ground of everything. You know that you walked into a place that's really going to, yeah. There we go. It's really going to uh, take you to another level. Chef, what are you making there? So this right here was from this past weekend. I got invited to New York to uh, be one of five chefs that cooked for Pepsi Diggin. And it's a national initiative that Pepsi had launched to support uh, black businesses um, during this time of the year. And so I was invited to cook the main entree. You sure we can say Pepsi in Atlanta? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> Pepsi brought me up. I'm sorry, Coke. <laughs> but uh, this is me in there uh, preparing the food, getting everything ready. Um, that was a wonderful experience because I always wanted to cook at the James Beard house, and they have mm-hmm. what they call the James Beard platform at Pier 50, 57 in New oh. York. Wow. And to be in that environment with all those great shells was just uh, just just a continual highlight of my career there. Yeah, Very cool. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little about uh, cuisine. I mean, I know you have got the most phenomenal <laughs> burger, mm-hmm. and you got some killer. I think there's three different salads on there. Mm-hmm. But I know you got a lot more than that. Right. If you're into burgers, you definitely got to go over there and get the burger. But tell us about the cuisine. Well, the, the cuisine behind farm um, – you know, growing up in the South, you know, everything is fresh. Fresh is probably, you know, you hear it a lot, but I don't think really people embrace it enough. Right. And so everything that we have is all about fresh. And, and matter of fact, I go to the market every day and get all, all of our produce for the restaurant. 
I'll go and hand pick it. And Where do you go? I go to either the, the Beef or Highway uh, Farmer's yeah. Market there yeah. or DeKalb. Uh, Farmers Mike, all of them here in DeKalb County, so uh, we support. You, you don't think about that except for New York or something? No, it, it's something that uh, when you think about New York, of course, yes, but most cuisines, most most cultures around the world, that's what they do. They go. True. Either you have a farm, you go get it, or you go to the farmer on the back of their truck and you pick it um, just, to, just to make sure that the quality is there. Um, but we, we do a lot of great things, great burgers, like you say, you know, on a nice brioche bun that we make in-house. Uh, we do a nice roasted garlic aioli, some Brussels sprout slaw. Yes. We got the caramelized onions with the bourbon yes. on there. We got a nice chicken thigh crispy sandwich that we serve as well, uh, grilled chicken sandwich, fish sandwiches. And we try to switch it up so that there's always something new to expect. Whenever and your salmon is amazing. That, that, that salmon is one of the hottest dishes yeah. that we have. We can't get it off the menu. It's pan seared uh, we serve it with a nice roasted cauliflower we do some curry beans with that um, and it's served with a, a parsnip puree and we probably sell out of that every weekend every night well now we're talking food when mm-hmm. can you come over and experience the food when are you all open so it's a fine line between our restaurant operations and the academic piece so during the right. week we do a lot of academic work so we tend to open up on friday nights from 6 p.m to 9 p.m uh, and then you'll do uh, available for brunch uh, in the mornings from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on Saturdays. And then we'll have dinner again Saturday night from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we are going to expand into a Sunday brunch soon. Mm-hmm. So look for an announcement for that. And we are going to start to do more chef's tables, kind of like the one you was invited to okay. on Thursday night. So please look out for a lot of marketing material that's going to go out And what we're trying to do is slowly start to expand now since we're out of COVID, now since we're out of that whole entire isolation period. And plus, we went on a huge entire like educational blitz. Now we're bringing more of our restaurant operations back. Well, I have to say, I highly suggest the chef's table. Go eat for sure. But the chef's table, it will going to be amazing. Yes. The chef's table is such a unique uh, experience because you're in the back of the kitchen. Um, We have a huge kitchen. You do. it's, It's massive. And we put a huge table back there. We decorate it all nice. The glassware, you got a designated uh, server back there. Mm-hmm. And you get a direct look behind the scenes, like right down the line. You can see us going back and forth on the line, cooking the whole smells and everything else. But I, I can give you an experience that you haven't seen before. The chef, you're going to have the salad plate empty and then one person per item of the salad? You're going to do that? Um, say that one more time. Okay, when you had that VIP opening, mm-hmm. we had our salad plate. Ah, yeah. And then each person, like one person put the lettuce, if you mm-hmm. had another kind of lettuce, and then one person added tomatoes. And mm-hmm. that was the most amazing production I'd ever seen in my life. And you know what? I came up with that on the spot. Oh, okay. I was like, you know what? We got 10, it worked. Pe- 10 people here. Everybody get a component, and I want you to put it in the same spot. On everyone's well, how plate. How many years ago was that? And I remember that. I remember yeah. the stories, and I remember the wine pairings. Mm-hmm. The food was phenomenal, mm-hmm. but you know that, right? But this other part was just yeah, such memorable experience, right? Right. And the thing that we keep forgetting is that these are young men and women being a part of that, yeah, and doing it on a high level. Like when people come to our restaurant, please don't think that you're coming to a culinary school driven restaurant. That is not the case. Our restaurant is voted very highly. Uh, we've been awarded many, many awards from just, you know, different platforms. So you come in to get a great dining experience. Oh, yeah. We just happen to have some men and women in the back, young, that's learning, training, developing, and using this as a platform for their career. The chef, are you open uh, for catering? Do we you, are. For events? We maybe? are. We do. And we have a couple of outlets for catering. Of course, you can come to farm, farmkitchenabar.com. Or just come to the restaurant. You can speak with one of our managers, and you can either take over our restaurant. You can do a buyout. We can reconfigure the whole entire thing, the bar, the service. We can do all kinds of special corporate gatherings, birthdays, you name it. Uh, We also do off-premise drop-offs. So that's through our Earth First Catering. So anyone that wants like a corporate meal, uh, you want a a conference set up or whatever, we can come, drop it off, set it up, good to go. But if you want like that full-blown um catering experience that's Schuler events and that's master chef driven you're talking about bar mitzvahs weddings large corporate events 700,000 plus people on premise off premise you name it 
we are a high-end luxury style catering company. So it's a great opportunity to get that experience from me and my team through both of those opportunities. Now, I knew you had the catering because we've been over there mm -hmm. for the events. I didn't know you had all the, the outside catering aspects. That's very cool to, right. to yep. learn about. Mm -hmm. So um, so let's shift to you being the first master, first African-American master chef in America. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what do you have to do to get that? Um, well, first off, let me say this. There's a lot of chefs who have mastered the art of cooking. I just went the long route to prove that I mastered the art of cooking. Um, they, they call this a test of a lifetime. Mm. There's 130 hours over eight days of wow. cooking. Um, and you can't BS yourself through that. Okay. No matter what yeah. people say, cause people always twitch their, you know, nose up like, mm, master chef, like certified. Like, what is that? Um, there's only 72, uh, in, in the United States. Um, and in 2014, I took the test, Pasadena, California, and I just happened to be the first minority African American to pass the test. Um, I'm more proud of the fact that it was a goal that I set for myself when I was in culinary school. A young kid, 19 years old, uh, was inspired by other master chefs, and it was all European master chefs, white master chefs, but I was inspired by them. I saw them going out and being examples to other young men and women of all races. And I saw them sharing their knowledge. And there's something about sharing that does something to me. And so when I saw these chefs come out, mainly through competitions, they'll come out and judge and give feedback. And you take that feedback and you apply it to your daily activities. Um, that does something to a young man to, or a woman who says, wow, you know, I, I put my best foot forward, but they helped me take it to a whole nother level. And I said, I wanted to do that. And everything I did from that point was to become a certified master chef. It was a goal of mine. So in 2004, I tried out for the Olympic team. I didn't make it, and that set me back. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back and regroup, refocus on the fundamentals, refocus on you know the things that's going to get me to that next level. Then I tried out for the Olympic team, and I made it in 2008. And after that experience on the Olympic team, which is equivalent to 10 years industry experience, I took that and uh -huh. said, you know what? It's time for me to take the MasterChef exam. Now, the success rate of that is around 30 40 percent wow yes and it doesn't mean that the chefs who went and took the test is not at the top of their game that's not the case it, a lot of things have to happen uh for you to really pass that test all the way through one you got to be mentally focused two you got to be fit physically in shape because you're working non-stop hardcore grind uh even though you have segments that's about five to six hours you're still up after that studying getting ready for the next day so imagine doing that for eight days, and then on the eighth day, you have to take two segments, two five-hour segments, which is equivalent to 50% of your overall score, and you have to have a, a cumulative average of around 75 or higher. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things in place to, one, uh, validate your ability to be a master, but there's a lot of things in place that can kind of slow you down from achieving that. But it's a highlight of my career, and that's the reason why as a master you want to have an apprentice. And so we created the Shula Institute to kind of, you know, demystify some of those steps so that young men and women can follow my footsteps and be masters at, of their craft at some point in their career. So off the subject, have you ever met um, Gordon Ramsay? No, I haven't. I haven't. And and, and what's crazy is uh, out of all celebrity shows that I would love to meet, would be, love to meet him. Yeah, he just yeah. seems like he'd be very interesting mm -hmm. to meet. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you got your master chef position. You created this. You created the um, Schuler Institute to train. What's next? What's next? Um, what people don't understand is like my, my overall goal is to open up a bunch of restaurants and concepts. Over the years, you do a lot of studying, um, you know, formulating ideas, and. That's just one of my goals, you know. So um, we have, we're launching projects up in Milwaukee right now. We're, we're having talks with um, projects in New York and Harlem, uh, upstate New York, Delaware. Um, so we are expanding pretty aggressively. Um, that is really my goal. I want to have an enterprise. 
So are we talking restaurants or the Schuler Institutes in other areas? Restaurants and, and schools as well. Because okay. um, our school is designed to go into small communities and be able to just make an impact there, right? We'll have large main campuses throughout the country, but we'll have little small little micro programs that we can do in conjunction with like corporate partners and things like that. But my goal is to open up restaurants and concepts throughout the country. Now, is anyone mm-hmm. else doing a setup like this and or a concept like this? Um, I'm not sure. I think a lot of people have the idea of diversifying, you know, their their portfolio from a business standpoint. Um, but for me, that was always my plan. Everything that I've done or doing right now was in the works five and six years ago. Have you ever thought about you know how Atlanta's going? Uh, just launched with their um, uh, Michelin mm-hmm. ratings and all. You ever want to get that? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but that's 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 you there all the time. Focus on that. That is no joke. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people just look at the Michelin and, say, and think that oh wow, I can get me a little star and be a celebrity. No, you don't understand the sacrifice those chefs, those restaurant operators, those maitre d's put into giving a high level excellence every single night. It's no joke. And is it you, true that when you're a uh, you're not the chef, you're a cook. You mm-hmm. do one thing mm-hmm. every day, every night. Is that true in that, a Michelin? That is true. That is true. Because you you need that you need that constant reputation, re, you know, repetitiveness, right? You you're constantly doing it over and over and over again until you have mastered that station and then you move over to something else. And that's the reason why I think a lot of times people say, Well, how come there's not a whole lot of Michelin star chefs in Atlanta and all over the place? Um, it's just a different mindset you have to have. You know, some people got to understand the importance of patience and the importance of persistence and the importance of being proficient at what you do. In order for you to be a proficient, meaning that you got to be pro, meaning that you do things at the highest level possible. And then you got to be efficient. You got to do it in a short amount of time and you got to do that all the time. And so when you think about coming in to work at two o'clock, you're not leaving until about 11 o'clock at night. That's what's required for those Michelin star restaurants. Yeah. And especially when you start thinking about two and three star. Um, but that, that type of training is, is undeniable. And when you go through a Michelin star restaurant training or operation for a period of time, you know that you laid the foundation for your career uh, to be really, really successful. You ever watch the show The, the Bear? I do. I do. Yeah, yeah I yeah. just started watching that where he <laughs> left a Michelin star mm-hmm. restaurant. Of course, if you say the second show, his chef was just a royal mm-hmm. pain. Mm-hmm. But it was very cool seeing that Michelin, and then he goes and opens up this sandwich. Mm-hmm. He inherits a sandwich shop. Mm-hmm. But you, people don't understand. It's a very rewarding career, but it is a very hard career. I mean, I was in the hotel business for about 15 years mm-hmm. with sales and catering and uh, I have six months acting F and food and beverage director. So, but it's a very rewarding career. But you are putting the hours in. You you, you are putting the hours in. But at, no matter what in life, you're going to have to put in some work somewhere. Right. Let's just accept that. Right. Right. So I'd rather put time and effort into something that's going to benefit me in the long run, developing me, uh, you know, mentally uh, from a from a development standpoint, technical standpoint, versus not having that, and then you're looking for another job and looking for another job, and then. Not having that is 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 just as um, you know difficult as anything else. So, so uh, chef, with you all the cooking and all the institutes institutes and restaurants, have you done any TV work? I have quite a bit. What have you done? Let's, let's talk about that now. Let me see. I'm gonna go back. Uh, I've done a lot of little cameos. Uh, I've done an episode of um, uh, Homemade Simple back in the day. It was on OWN. Um, I actually shot a couple of pilots for a production company that oh. was shows they pitched for the Food Network and stuff like that. Um, but last year, I got my own TV show. Oh, that's good. Let's talk about that now. Yes. So um, give a shout out to G. Garvin. Um, we shot an episode of City Eats here uh, featuring um, our restaurant, Farm Kitchen and Bar, with my business partner, Sean Rush. And after we shot that segment, he reached out to me and was like, hey, chef, would you like to be a part of a TV show. And I was like, well, what kind of TV show? Um, <clears throat> he was like, well, you'd be able to stand and stir is what they call it. And I was like, okay, well, how much creative, you know, freedom will I have? And he was like, well, it's all about you. So it's called Twisted Dish. Let's see if we can find that. Yes. It airs on Sunday night. Here we go.
Did you come up with the name? No, that name was already in place. Uh, so how long have you done this now? Uh, just shot this last year. Okay. Um, 25 episodes. Um, they aired 17 of the 25 so far. Um, first show ever. And oh. all of those episodes, all one take. That is amazing. So no you can retake. watch this show called <laughs> Twisted Dish. Twisted Dish. Right. Um, so you watch it on YouTube, I believe. Uh, they have a, the episodes on YouTube, but you also can go to their website, AspireTV.com, and they have the episodes there as well. So we got to check you out there. Now, you said you were on a TV show across that was filmed at your place here. What was mm-hmm. that one called? City Eats. City Eats. We're going to have to find that show. That and sounds like uh, that's cool. It is, and they air on Aspire TV as well on Thursday nights, um, and they feature and highlight different restaurants in the city of Atlanta. So it's, it's a really great show. They're doing some great programming over there. I'm proud to be associated with them. It just is such an honor. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, we're getting close to uh, the show. Do you have a favorite dish? That's a great question. Um, you know, I like doing dishes that remind me of home. Okay. And one of the dishes I remember my mother would make, and me and my brother would just go in there and just devour um, is a pot of oxtails. Mm, okay. and, she, and growing up in the South, she would just get the oxtails and put them on the stove and let them simmer, and then she'll have a pot of rice, and then she may have some greens and cornbread and all that stuff. And the moment that she says, ready, we'll just go in, and we would just eat them up. And she would go for dessert because she'll spend all day cooking them, and me and my brother go in there and just, just go through them. But I love doing that because it just reminds me of home, and it keeps me grounded as well because forget all the fame, forget all the recognition and stuff like that. Where it started from is where we should all remember, and it started there. And there's a lot of people, a lot of young men and women that are looking at their parents and mothers and caregivers and saying, you know, what's to eat? You know, what what, what will we have for dinner tonight? Yeah. And so we want to give them an opportunity to see their dreams come true as well through the True Institute. You know, the funny, my favorite meals are what I call comfort food. Yes. So like um, pot roast mm-hmm. and spaghetti uh, chicken pot pie, mm-hmm. shepherd's pie. Mm-hmm. Um, it, those are just to me that just. I guess that reminds me of my mom cooking, and it's just it's just you, it's like good for your heart. That you, you don't remember, like you remember some some of the stuff that we did for you a couple of years ago, mm-hmm. but you really have vivid memories of the times to where you went over bit mama house and she wasn't expecting you to come. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> but she went in the kitchen and pulled something out. You remember that. Yep, you That do. comfort food connects with you. And the reason why it connects with you, because the person who prepared it for you did it with pure love and passion. And yeah. you can taste and feel when somebody made you something with love and passion. And that's why it's important that in this industry that you're not just looking at hospitality as a gateway for you to be a celebrity. Choose it because you really have love and passion for people and using your art and your craft through food to impact people in a positive way. I think you hit it on the head. You have to have that passion for people, or you're going to yeah. burn out. You will. It's going to be done, over with. You can take your chef code and your Instagram followers and go hang it up. It's not yeah. going to last. It takes passion and dedication to see it long term. Well, Chef, before we knew you were coming on, so we asked the viewers mm-hmm. some questions that they want me to ask you. Okay. You okay with Let's that? Let's do it. So... Um, we had we had all kinds of questions come in, and Monica had to pare them down to three. So, what made you fall in love with food? You kind of talked about it, but you mm-hmm. can answer it again. And well, the the love what made me fall in love with food. Um, one, we all love to eat, yeah. but I, I really love the the first dish my mother taught us, me and my brother, because she would work and she would come home late, and we had to have dinner on the table. She taught us how to take a piece of pork chop. And we'll season it, and we'll dredge it in flour, and we'll sear it in a little cast iron pan with some of that grease in that little coffee can on top of the stove. Oh, yeah. And we'll brown it, and then we'll throw uh, some flour in that grease and some water, and we was making the pan gravy. Yeah. Right? And you throw some onions in there, some green beans, and that was just like a learning lesson that lasted me for life. And that's where the love of cooking came from for me. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Now, this I thought was a very interesting question. Mm-hmm. 
especially for a certified chef. Right. Do you like pineapple on your pizza? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I love those flavors, you know, uh, you know, like a barbecue pineapple. Listen, I, I'm just weird like that. I like that. Here's my question. Right. Do you like, uh, I can't find it. I love anchovies on pizza. Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't really do it all that much. I love I'll it. You it can't much. find it much. Yeah, not me. How much? So what's the strongest food combination you've come up with? Um, that I've came up with? Strangest. Strangest. That's my problem being dyslexic. Strangest food combination. Oh, my goodness. I ran across someone who tried to make me a salad with, um, they tried to put ice cream on a salad. And they had artichokes, and they did some type of soy vinaigrette with a vanilla ice cream. And I said, where's the vanilla ice cream coming from? He said, well, it's supposed to melt and turn into like a vinaigrette. It's supposed to be most, I, I don't know, it was off the wall. Did it work? It did not work. That's yeah. why it was so strange. <laughs> well, now that you said salad, it's like I ate at this breakfast place and I ordered an omelet mm -hmm. and it came with a salad. I'm like, yeah, for breakfast? I don't know. We're in a day and age where pretty much anything goes, huh? Yeah, I tell you, it must be. Well, Chef, do you have any closing, uh, any specials going on at the restaurant? Mm -hmm. Anything you want to share with our viewers before we close? Mm -hmm. Well, first off, thank you for this platform, and thank you to DeKalb County and everyone for just allowing me to just share this. Um, over at Farm, Kitchen, and Bar, we're constantly elevating what we do in our service. So for those people who really enjoy a great night of dinner, wine pairings, just a great intimate uh, experience. Go to farmkitchenandbar.com, make reservations. I highly recommend that you make reservations because you're not going to get a seat walking through the door mm -hmm. or you may, may have to put you at the bar, um, <clears throat> but you get an absolutely amazing experience. And then for the families, before you go hit the road on Saturday mornings, come get some great grits and homemade chicken sausage and our chicken and waffles and all the great food that mm -hmm. we have and our cat head biscuits and our jams and our chow chow and you name it we're doing some really really great things over there um, but also remember that behind what we do is we're doing it for a good cause and we want to help people one get off the streets you know look at life a little bit different um, but we want to do it through hospitality and so we have on our website um, a link that you can go and help support the education of these students our tuition is very low for a reason because we want to make it attainable but we also want to try to make it merit-based and tuition less so if you want to contribute want to donate you got corporate partners that will look at Schuler Institute as a partner or a partnership or a resource that can help drive our educational platform please reach out to us um, and you can follow me at Chef Daryl Schuler CMC on all of, my, all of my social media platforms and we just look forward to many, many years of great success here in DeKalb County. Well, Shelf, thanks again for being on our show. It's been a great show, and uh, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm.